Well, good morning, dear Messiah, and welcome this morning, and we also say good morning to all those who are watching us virtually, and uh, I just have a couple things for you. First of all, I would like to introduce Pastor Mendel Adams. He is from the UCC Church, and his, his, he is now retired after 50 years in the pulpit. Is that correct? <laughs> so... Um, we're very pleased to have him with us this morning. And uh, also, uh, I've been told there is no Sunday school uh, service this morning. And so if anyone looks for it, there's a lesson, I guess, there, but not, not a virtual uh, message. So, uh, Pastor, you had something you'd like to say? One more time, someone say, one more time, and they go over to one more 
think I was going to do that. And I'm walking very carefully, going down the hall, and I started singing the tune, even though I never heard the song. My wife tells me I got the tune wrong. And we're going down uh, towards the sanctuary, and the next thing I knew, that old cane became a walking stick, and I was really in the groove when I got in the sanctuary. And I am sharing that with you because we have been excluded from the service. And it's good to be in the service. One more about it. He didn't have to let me live, but he did. And I'm going to make use of that today by singing the praises of God. I am honored to be here worshiping with you one more time. Amen. I do have just one more announcement. We also have a guest organist. Judy Gilmore is blessed, blessing us with, with her music, and uh, we certainly thank her also for filling in in Glenn's absence. Thank you, folks. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we are captive to sin and, and cannot, cannot free, free ourselves. ourselves. We, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ has forgiven has given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, alert us to the threatening dangers of our sin and redeem us for your life of justice. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first, the first reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Word of God, word of life. And now let us sing responsibly Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, I trust in you. Let me not be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Let none who look to see you be put to shame. Rather, let those be put to shame who are treacherous. Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. In you have I trusted all the day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and love for they are from everlasting remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness O Lord you are gracious and upright O Lord therefore you teach sinners in your way you lead the lowly in justice and teach the lowly your way. All your paths, O Lord, are steadfast love and faithfulness to those who keep your covenant. The second reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts and holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Word of God, word of life. Be to God. Well, I had a, uh, uh, something worked out for the children today, and so I hope that there are some children out there that are watching uh, virtually this day. And 
I sat down this morning and read the Plain Dealer, and there is a section in the Plain Dealer that stole my sermon. <laughs> stole it. It is a whole thing on Hanukkah. If you have a chance to read over that today, read that. That is excellent. Very well done. So I brought the menorah today to talk about Hanukkah and to refresh our mind. The lighting of candles is a, is a concept that goes clear back, probably way back before there were temples or maybe even religion at all, when people sat around the campfire and shared stories and, wrote and, and lit fires to remind them of the presence of something that was beyond them. So we have lit candles, and, and tomorrow is the first evening of the eight-day celebration of Hanukkah, which the Jewish people celebrate in their homes and some of them in their synagogues and temples. It is eight days in which there are nine candles. One is called the helper candle, and it is the one that we use to light all the other candles. So there are eight candles to be lit, one each day for eight days. And it has to do, some of you know that story pretty uh, well, but it has to do with the time when the uh, uh, an Asian occupying army had occupied Israel for something like 300 years, and the people were really upset about that, and one of the things that they had done, it was an Asian uh, uh, army that was under the Greek authority, and so they had rededicated the temple, the great temple that was dedicated to God, and they had rededicated it to Zeus, and had just done awful things that were against all of the tradition of the one God that we know now in the Jewish God, the Yahweh, which is the God of Jesus. So, there was a war, and there was a war of liberation, and this occupying army had been run out of town, and so they decided they wanted to rededicate the temple. And Hanukkah means simply just dedicate. And it came time to dedicate the temple, and do you have an eternal flame here? Above the pulpit. Right here. And the eternal flame is to show in our sanctuaries. I'm not sure. Is that is that electric? Yes. That's electric. Well, that's cheap. You know that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it still means the same thing. It's to remind people of the presence of God that was with them. It goes clear back to the story in Moses where the Shekinah glory followed them to show the people that God was with them in their travels through the uh, wilderness of sin. And so there was a lit candle like this that was burning in the Holy of Holies. And of course, when Zeus was installed as the god of the temple, they destroyed all that. So when it came time to rededicate the temple, they cleaned it up real good. The uh, altar guild and so forth got in there and cleaned it up and made sure that everything was right. And uh, and then they said, well, we've got to have the eternal flame, but the lamp is broken, so they repaired the lamp. And then they said, well, where's the oil that has to be used, the only oil that has to be used to light the candle, to light the flame? And they grounds around with all the people and they said, well, here's a little bit here, a little bit there, and they put it all together and they had enough that under normal circumstances to keep the flame burning that brightly, it would have been just enough to last one day. And so they said, well, what do we do? Damascus, which was the only place that sold the right oil, was four days' journey. And so they right away, they pooled their money, they they got these guys to decide to make the trip to Damascus, Syria, from Jerusalem, four days journey along the road to Damascus, in which there were highwaymen and robbers and thieves and murderers along the way. And they went to Damascus, four days journey, bought the oil, and made it back. Miracle of miracle. When they got there, they noticed that something had happened. And I'm suggesting that probably what happened was 
they turned the flame down to where it was just a flicker. But the flame had stayed burning for one whole week. Eight days later, they put the oil in, and so miracle, miracle. It is a miracle, and so there are all kinds of stories about how God had performed a miracle, making the oil that was supposed to last only a day, last for eight days, to remind us. So, part of what we do in Advent is we light candles. It reminds me of that little song. Now, I told my wife I was going to sing it, and she told me I shouldn't, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> My wife is back here, so if you hear somebody saying mentally you preach too long, it's her. <laughs> I'm so pleased that you could be with me here. And the song goes like this. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I hit it up for a push or no, I'm going to let it shine. I hit under a push or no, I'm going to let it shine. I hit under a push or no, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, join me. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. No everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I can the clap your hands and worship. Well, along the same line, we have one more issue of business to take care of. This being the first Sunday in Advent, we get to light our first candle. Now, from what I've read, the first candle is called the candle of hope, and sometimes also known as the prophet's candle, because this is the one that says something's coming. Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see things, these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation 
will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Some signs are terrifying and some promises we pray will never be kept. They sound like uh, threats rather than the offer of something desirable. This week's gospel lesson begins toward the end of a larger discourse from Jesus foretelling the beginning of the end of life as his hearers know it. Horror movies have literally used these words to craft a vision designed to give us nightmares. End-time preachers have used them to scare us straight. It is a curious way to begin the season of Advent, a season that represents, as Tom says, hope and peace and joy and love, all those things. The signs, Jesus insists, will be everywhere, will be visible, obvious, and felt in the deepest part of our being. The magnitude of them will be discernible and even from light years away in the moon and the sun and the stars will display signs. The human eye will be able to observe these signs. With the benefit of telescopic lenses and astronomical advances, we know that the sun is in constant, volatile, and energized motion, but we avoid looking directly at that minimal view we have of the sun for fear of the damage that will wreck our vision. Jesus, in effect, lets us know that even the awesome power of the sun will be greatly magnified and will be made known. You see, life is fragile. We live under the looming threat of real life collapses in Afghanistan that took 20 years and 80 billion dollars of United States money to build collapsed in days. It's common to reach for things to shield us from the terror of our awareness that everything can end without notice, like a vapor. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that day will close upon you suddenly like a trap. These words placed on Jesus' tongue suggest a chronological expectation, but his immediate audience never saw the events described in any literal sense. In ancient imagination, the roaring and tossing of the sea symbolized an existential category of chaos, and it was scary. It still can be scary, but unless historians missed it, the age passed into the next without the heaven shaking, without celestial bodies emitting irregularities, or the Son of Man surfing the clouds in unvarnished power. Jerusalem fell. The Roman Empire met its demise, but the world of nations continues with its mass proliferation of inequality, violence, and exploitation. The TV evangelists and biblical literalists 
go through many contortions to explain these signs that Jesus mentioned. The promise that this generation will not pass away until all things take place has suggested there is at least one person, one lone person, who has lived for 2,000 years. Re remember, remember the, what's his name, uh, Mel Brooks's uh, deal that he did on the 2,000 year old Jew? Remember, it comes from this. There will not pass away. Someone's going to be living. The, uh, the concept, the myth of the wandering Jew comes back to this. You can't say Jesus was wrong. So you got to find a way to say it. Or you can do like the TV evangelists say, well, that has to do with the, the generation that witnessed the return of Israel to the Palestine area. That re they, and so, hey, guess what? That generation is passing away. And the signs have not been fulfilled. So here they are waiting for a second advent as if there's something deficient or wrong with the first advent. Like Albert Schweitzer, some have said just simply that Jesus as a person of his own time was a sincere apocalyptic preacher who just read the signs wrong. And a Baptist preacher that I recently heard shared this with me. He asked if the symbolism of Jesus' depiction of hopeful chaos is not about some distant time or ultimate ending, what if Jesus is snatching us out of our desire for another world by asking us to face the jarring details of this world? I see Jesus, he says, making a case for the fragility of this life and the fierce need for people of faith to show up each day with stamina and courage. Adam Schiff's book Midnight in Washington talks about his hope for our country in this way. We must understand that we are not passengers on the journey unable to steer the country we all love in a direction or another. It is within our power to take hold of the rudder, choose the future we want for our children and grandchildren, and with the grace of God, make it so. A lack of awareness of our own finitude pushes us to act in ways opposed to the call of the abundant life in the here and now. For some Christians, salvation amounts to an escape from the present. It feeds a narcissistic need for longevity beyond the limits of existence. The fragility of life leads some of us to fumble around for meaning, leaving us satisfied with the hope based on ontological exclusivity. We run away from terror of our own eternal now by out-believing, out-praying, out-worshipping, out-do-gooding those who are not like us, all of us as preconditions to live again in some great by and by. Martin taught us differently. This can produce a destructive sort of leave it to Jesus logic. If the only prospect for justice and liberation we can see is tied to the second coming, this deeply harms the quality of our life together. There is no time to wait. The kids are right. This is not the time to stare into the sky with our hands tied behind our backs as child hunger looms, the racial wealth gap widens, and the gender-based violence grows. If we leave it exclusively to Jesus in the clouds, the frailty of existence on our vulnerable globe will continue to worsen. A second coming is not the answer to structural racism or the dangerous momentum of infectious disease 
or even the warming of our global home. Our hope for peace and equity should not be relegated entirely to a sudden cosmic rending of the skies. What if now, paradoxically, both fragile and eternal is all we have? What if now is all we have? Benjamin E. May wrote, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in that minute. We cannot waste the power and potential of the eternal now. Eternity is less the action of God before time or life with God after time than it is the presence of God in time. Eternal life is a quality of existence as we journey here in the flesh. Jesus the carpenter, who accepted the complexities of his identity, models and integrates what theologian Paul Tillich called the new being in our time and in our lives. The new being, our sense of eternal life now, offers us a resilient capacity to respond to the contradictions, insecurities, and problems cascading toward us. To follow the carpenter and his teachings means to own the work of justice and mercy as a manifestation of our collective and personal eternity amid a crumbling world. Empowered by the words of our Lord Jesus that will never pass away, people of the way must respond to life as it is now is all there is, greeting each morning with an unequivocal yes to our vocation of liberation for all. The legacy of Jesus turns on our mutual work to liberate the unprotected from the violence of the oppressor and to free the oppressor from their own privilege and oppression. Deadly pathogens and devastating storms are not the tools of a just God trying to introduce the end of creation, but they are consequences of our dereliction of accountability to humanity, the earth, and to God. We can no longer afford the exorbitant cost of wasting this eternal now. We only have a minute, it has 60 seconds, and each one of those seconds is the eternal now. God help us, amen. Thanks be to God, that's the truth, hallelujah.
In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. God of presence and peace, strengthen your church around the globe to proclaim the message of your love coming to the world. Open our hearts to recognize your face in all people and in all of creation. Hear us, O God. God of mighty redwoods and microscopic plants, fields and city parks, the wind and the waves, be a healing balm to our wounded planet. May we nurture what you have longingly created. Hear us, O oh God. God of equity and compassion, bring righteousness and goodness to all peoples of the earth. Give a heart of discernment and integrity to leaders in our communities. Hear us, O God. God of comfort and care, be present with those who watch and wait. Come to all who await births, deaths, divorces, new unions, new jobs, retirements, healing, and life transitions of every kind. And we especially ask you to be with Ruth, Lila, Nancy, Ron, Alexandra, Janie, David, Christine, Adam, Lisa, Bill, Irene, Phyllis, and the family and friends of John Davis. Hear us, O God. God of promises kept and new dreams awakened, shelter your people from destructive storms. We pray for those whose lives have been upended by natural disasters, for the work of Lutheran Disaster Response, Lutheran World Relief, and other relief organizations. Hear us, O God. God of companionship and community, we give you thanks for the saints who journeyed with us and now abide in you. Even in distress and uncertainty, make us confident that your promises endure forever. Hear us, O God. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you.
thanks to you, holy God. For by your word, you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gift, freedom from captivity, wander on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh. You speak to us and call us to witness, forgiveness through the cross, life to those in whom by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gift within us. Renew our faith. Increase our hope. And deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who Lord, art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As God has gathered us and filled our hearts with the gospel, now God sends us forth to serve in mission. Let us pray. Gracious God, through belief in Christ and through the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, empower us to share the word, care and support each other in God's community, worship as a family in Christ, and be Christ-like examples those whose lives we touch. Amen. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in belief, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen. Amen.
one peace. Christ is near. Thanks be to God.